to welcome this morning Professor Mark Hill um, for his presentation on how computing may change our world. Um, Dr. Hill is a professor emeritus in computer sciences at UW-Madison. His work um, over his career has targeted computers with complex memory systems, multiple processing cores, and simulated systems. Dr. Hill has, has collaborated with over 160 authors, holds over 40 patents, and has held a number of positions in the computer industry. He has served as chair of the UW Computer Sciences Department and has also chaired um, the Computing Community Consortium, a national computing think tank. He has won several prestigious awards and is an active um, member and fellow of several national professional societies. Professor Hill has his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. So now without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Mark Hill. Uh, thank you, Trish, uh, for that nice introduction. Uh, so I'm going to present for you today, uh, How Computing May Change Our World. And it's maybe not a, a immodest title. All right, what happened here? Okay, uh, so this talk is gonna have four parts. Uh, the first part, I'm gonna give some background on this Computing Community Consortium, and in particular, how it's helping catalyze how computing has and will change our world. And then I'm gonna go into three specifics of what uh, this covers, artificial intelligence or machine learning, quantum computing, and computing in society. So I'm going, because of the format, we're gonna to have to defer questions to the end, and, but you can type them into the chat whenever I finish a section, uh, but I, we won't answer them until the end. Uh, and you do that by pressing this chat button at the bottom uh, and then it brings up this panel shown here, and then you can type in a question to all panelists so that it can be read to me. And then when you hit carriage return, the question will appear up here. And like I said, we'll cover them later. So I'll remind you of this at the end, but that's how you ask questions uh, in this uh, pandemic world we're living in. All right, so computing has changed our world. And most of us are senior enough that we remember many of these changes. Uh, we've moved from telephones to things like this Zoom that we're using right now. Very different situation. Uh, I had an encyclopedia growing up uh, in my bedroom, uh, authored by one person and quickly got out of date. And now we have Wikipedia and other resources that are authored by many people, kept up to date. I even saw Super Bowl results appear within a few minutes of the end of the game. Uh, I used a typewriter in college. It was awful. I was only like 99% correct. So it required a lot of whiteout and retyping. I was very pleased when I finally got a word processor and I could craft and re-edit documents. And finally, in the last pandemic, people had postal mail. And now we have a proliferation of things, not only email, but Facebook and Twitter, and I don't know, LinkedIn, and I don't know, whatever else you use, uh, which has caused great change uh, for good or ill. So why is computing so effective in so many different places? Uh, I'm a computer hardware expert, so I'm perhaps a little biased, but I think one of the reasons is universal hardware. And I'm gonna say what I mean by that. Okay, so this is a picture of a 1980s PC. Um, it's, it's a universal hardware. And you would be surprised if you go at the insides, this is very similar to an iPhone, even though they look rather radically different. And it's similar in one important way because they both use software and they are hardware. So what is software, right? Software is an algorithm or a set of instructions. Now in grade school, your teacher taught you how to do long division. So you were given a bunch of instructions how to take a number, any number later, and divide by any other number later to get the quotient. And you were probably taught in English because you're smart, okay? Computer hardware is really dumb and so we have to teach computer hardware how to do things and tell it, give it instructions in a very uh, mechanical, anal language. And these are called programming languages. And so you probably heard some of these things binded about like C++, uh, Java, and Python. They're just languages that are very unambiguous so that the dumb computer can understand them. So with these software instructions, we can load them on the hardware. And then what that does is it makes this computer, among other things, be a divide machine. And so if you can give it some input data, like A is 1200 and B is 50, 
and tell it to go, out will come the quotient 24, and you have a divide machine. This algorithm to do division can be expressed sort of like on a single page, like a sonnet. Uh, these other algorithms for specifying Zoom and Wikipedia and all these social media things, they're also algorithms. They don't fit on a page. They're like a gigantic book, but they're the same thing, only more complicated. And they allow your computer to be a, a Zoom machine, an encyclopedia, and a social media thing, also requiring a bunch of networking. But really, it's the same thing. And what's super powerful about this is, one, the computer can do more than one thing. And two, it can even do things that are not done at the time you buy your computer. So you are probably using a version of Zoom right now that, that is newer than your computer. Or more importantly, when computers were deployed in the 90s and by phone email showed up uh, with America Online and companies like that, uh, it spread quickly because the computers that were already there to do word processing and spreadsheets could be adapted to do this new thing. So computing saves money by doing many things and speeds adoption by being able to do things with new software on old hardware. And so one, one task, one hardware for many tasks selected by software. Okay, so you might think that change, you know, you've seen so much change that the change is done, okay? Well, I'm here to tell you, I think big changes are afoot. Uh, one of those changes is virtual reality. So this is a picture of a holodeck uh, from Star Trek Next Generation. I'm a nerd, I'm sorry. Uh, where you could go onto this deck and you could simulate something and be somewhere that really wasn't there. Okay. Uh, people are working on this virtual reality. I'll show you a slide next with the current state. But this is a big deal. I think this could be as big a deal as uh, mice and icons replacing the old DOS based uh, command lines to give you a, a new environment. And it'll start with games, but it'll spread to other things like business meetings, virtual travel. Uh, looking what your remodeling will look like uh, before it's done. A sibling of uh, virtual reality is augmented reality, where uh, you have reality, but then you give it, you augment it with additional information. So this is showing a mock-up of uh, a warehouse where the augmented reality is saying uh, what items are that somebody is supposed to pick up and, and deliver to a customer. This has great potential for uh, fun and other things, uh, for example, uh, you might want to have a birding application that you show a bird and it tells you what bird it is. Now, this sounds far-fetched, uh, but I already have a crude version of this on my, mo uh, my smartphone where uh, I can point it to the sky at night and it knows where I am and which direction I'm pointing and it'll tell me what stars and planets I'm looking at. So I think this will be a big thing and those of us that are getting older really want the version that uh, pops up the name of the person who's standing in front of us. Personalized learning. Uh, one of the key techniques for learning is to give people examples that are rich enough to stretch them, but not so big as to break them. And where people are at any given time is different. And so wouldn't it be nice if we could, all, we could give everybody exactly the, anim, the examples that move them forward the fastest? It's just one example of how you do teaching. You know, we can't do this with mass teaching. Like when I give examples in class, I have to give a, you know, an easy, medium, and hard one to hope that it resonates across the distribution of the class. So personalized learning has an uh, opportunity to make learning uh, more fun because you can advance faster and not be bored or not, and not be overwhelmed either. Uh, but of course there are problems because we still need to figure out how to motivate people, which human teachers are really excellent at doing. Another example of a future change is self-driving vehicles. Now, some of you in the audience may say, ah, that's a bunch of BS. I heard so much about this and it hasn't happened. And I'll come back to this later. But this is going to take longer than you think. There's already been great progress. I don't know if you've driven in a car that does lane following and does adaptive speeding with respect to the car in front of you. It's actually a really nice assist. Getting to full self-driving vehicles will take much longer, but it's a big deal for all of us getting older and at some point losing our driver's license. A lot of this cool stuff is enabled by this really weird picture here, which I'm going to explain in a couple slides. And I don't expect you to understand what it is here. But this is a deep neural network. Technically, it's an artificial neural network. Um, and this is one of the key enablers to doing some of these things above. 
And uh, it gets its name because it's originally inspired by the neural network that's in the human neocortex. Okay, but the state of the art has evolved away from what human neurons do. So you can think of it as, you know, the Wright brothers were inspired by how birds fly. But then as they really developed the airplane, they took some things from birds and, and had to discard others. So for example, their early flyers had the shapes of the wings were very similar to bird wings, uh, but uh, they didn't flap. Now you might think, you know, like even things like virtual reality, how ridiculous, just science fiction, you know, but here shows a picture from this morning's newspaper about the great progress um, that's happening at Facebook with the Oculus Quest 2 and how, you know, you can do various things with it. Now, right now it's uh, for early adopter markets like gamers, uh, but I think it can get much more serious applications. And you can see this uh, application doesn't look a lot, a lot much like that holodeck. It looks much cruder, okay? But let me remind you that things get better. So here's a picture of one of the first uh, mice for a computer. This is a 1960s mouse, and now the mouse has evolved tremendously. I expect a similar thing for virtual reality. All right, so how does this happen? Well, it's a complicated process. A simple model of our the United States with respect to information technology is we have government, academia, industry, and citizens. And they all talk to each other to some extent about information technology progress illustrated by these thin dash lines, okay? And what we would like to do is we would like to increase and catalyze more action faster, okay? And that's the role of the CCC is to catalyze this virtuous cycle. This is not shown to scale because we're only two dozen people plus mostly professors plus some staff in Washington, DC. But we try to get people talking to each other and I'll show you uh, how in a second. I guess I'll show you how now right now. We, we do pre, pre competitive white papers and workshops. So we get together people developing cameras with the uh, police commissioners who are, uh, whose people have been deployed with body cameras. And we try to find out what the real problems are and motivate the ICT researchers for the nation's benefit. So the whole idea is to encourage government to fund more research in academia, academia to produce more students and ideas, industry to absorb those creative students and uh, create products which create value, which induce citizens to pay taxes and go around and around in the cycle. And you might say, well, who, who really cares who leads in this cycle? Um, but I would point out that some of the first movers in the industrial revolution, Europe and then the United States are still seeing advance, advantages from that many decades afterward. And it's the same thing with, uh, information technology in my judgment and uh, will be with our artificial intelligence as well. Okay, so that is my quick pitch that computing has changed the world uh, and the more change is afoot. Computing Community Consortium, which I led, uh, is a small part of catalyzing this. I'm gonna tell you about three activities that we did, mostly the background to the activities uh, and a little bit about what they did that I think are, are very important. And the first is uh, artificial intelligence or AI in machine learning. And this will free humans from many repetitive tasks, but there's a but, isn't there always a but? Okay, so artificial intelligence or AI, machine learning or ML, I'm gonna represent it here with what will be a Venn diagram. So there's this big blob here, which is the technologies that represent AI. And I'm only gonna have time to explain one of them in a little bit, but this is not a new thing. AI was, the term was coined in 1955 and there's been a, a lot of government funding and university work over uh, the 65 years. Uh, and you know, more recently there's been an explosion in industry, but if you think it's new, it's not new. It's just, it's a long time gestating. And that's true for a lot of technologies. So the challenge with AI is like, can we define it? It's really not easy to have a simple one phrase definition. We know what artificial is. Artificial means that it's not done by humans. In this case, it's done by machines. But what's intelligence? Intelligence is uh, exceedingly hard to define. If a machine can do that divide algorithm, would you consider it intelligent? I wouldn't. If we say intelligent means you're capable of writing Hamlet, 
I agree, you're intelligent if you can do that, but that's not a good definition of intelligent because it includes me and the rest of us. And so what is intelligent? It's very hard. There's a whole bunch of AI technologies and you know, it's hard to know where the boundary is, but a particularly important subset is easier to define. And this subset is called machine learning. So all machine learning technologies are part of AI, but there's AI technologies that are outside of machine learning. So machine learning or ML is easier to find. Machine means it's done by a machine or computer. Learning means that you have a task, you're able to do it, you get some things right, you get some things wrong. You're given some feedback on what you did right and wrong, and now you can do the task better. You've learned. And so this is important. There's a particular kind of machine learning. Not all machine learning is deep learning, but deep learning is an important part of machine learning that has just exploded. And so I'm going to explain it on the next slide because it's overhyped. It's actually profound as well. Uh, and it just exploded. Now, I should warn you that in the popular press, like even the New York Times, a lot of these terms are expressed as synonyms, but they're technically different. So you have to distinguish whether someone is making the technical difference or they're just using the term uh, broadly. So let's go into this deep learning, uh, technically deep neural networks, okay? And so what I'm gonna try to do is to give you some intuition of how this works. And I may or may not succeed in, in, in this. And afterward, even if I haven't succeeded, you can come back and then we'll talk about the implications, even if you don't know how it works. But let's try to figure out how it works because you can, I think you can get this. Okay, so it has two parts. The first part is training. Training is like going to school. Right, and, and for machine learning, training is you give it a bunch of example data labeled with the correct answer. Okay, now it's hard to see this picture here, but this shows a whole bunch of handwritten digits, zero, one, two to nine, uh, each labeled by their row, so whether they're zeros or whether they're ones. And we're gonna feed this into this network, and this network is gonna have an output that we're gonna train it to, so that if we give it a bunch of pixels, a bunch of image dots that look like a four, we hope the output that's asserted is four, okay? And there's some very fancy techniques to use the data that we have to train the network to almost always get the correct answer. And you can think of training the network as uh, there's some notion of error where you're getting the wrong answer and that's mapped into a map of terrain and the algorithm that trains the network tries to find a lower spot in the terrain that has less error without getting trapped in a, a local spot where the next valley is even low, lower. And technically it's very hard, but that's the basic idea. And so you train this network like you're in school to, for all these examples, to give really good answers. Now you graduate and you get to inference. So inference is where you get to put this network that you've trained on some examples and give it data that it has never seen before, and you hope it does well. So if you're given this image with a bunch of dots, some black, some white, you give it to this network, and it thinks about it, and it comes out, and if you've trained it well, it comes out and says eight. Uh, and this has very practical applications, right? Like reading zip codes on uh, handwritten addresses. Uh, it doesn't actually just say eight, it says eight with some probability, like 95%, and then the other 5% of probability is distributed among the other, other digits. And then if you're given this image of black and white, you, you fight it, and it, it comes out too. Um, this is it. It's surprisingly effective. Uh, let me compare this to linear regression. For those of you that remember what linear regression is, otherwise you can tune out. So linear regression was where you were given a bunch of data dots on a graph and you were, you were given a procedure, an algorithm to learn the best line to represent those dots. So you were learning a function from the dots to a line. Um, and uh, really what this deep neural learning network is learning a much more complicated function that's much more than a line, hence it's called nonlinear. And, but it's just learning this function like you were learning the line. So you might ask, is this learning? Yes, it's learning. You give it more examples, it does better. Is it intelligent? Yeah, I, I, don't, I wouldn't consider linear regression intelligent. I don't consider this intelligent, but respectable people could disagree. 
Um, the other challenge here, by the way, is not shown here, is that the number of examples that you have to feed it is tens or hundreds of thousands or not or millions. And so we can do this learning, but it's really expensive and it's not nearly as efficient at learning as my toddler granddaughter. All right, so even if I lost you there, uh, you can treat deep learning as this black box, which seems to do amazing things. And let's talk about the good and the bad and some of its implications. So the good news is we can learn these complex functions and we can do you know, fun things like recognizing cats in videos. Uh, and you might think this is you know, uh, ridiculous, but two things. One is we were never able to write an algorithm to effectively write cats. These machine learning algorithms do better than any of us programmers did at doing this. Secondly, some people like looking at cat videos and using computing to enhance the best parts of life is a good thing. We should use it to enhance the best and mitigate the worst. But more seriously, recognizing cats is not fundamentally different than recognizing pedestrians, which has very serious implications to self-driving vehicles. And some of you may have heard of a uh, you know, a couple of years ago, a very, you know, unfortunate incident in Arizona where the algorithms failed. They're getting better and they also can do language. So uh, things like Google Translate are getting way better by using certain kinds of um, deep neural networks to do translation, say, from English into Spanish. So that's the good. And the good is incredibly uh, good. The bad is several things. Uh, one is they're fragile. So a deep neural network was trained on a whole bunch of images and was presented with this image and it did not recognize this as a stop sign. Now you say, that's absurd. Anyone with common sense can recognize that this is a stop sign. Well, that's, that could be true, but the deep neural network algorithm doesn't have common sense. And probably the problem was it was never trained on any examples that had white and black rectangles in front of a red octagon, so it didn't know what to do with it. A second problem I alluded to is this explainability. Uh, so if you go to Netflix and you watch a bunch of movies, Netflix will say, you like these movies, perhaps you'll like this other one. And maybe I don't care for it to explain why it, uh, it, it thought so. I can just took, look at some of the recommendations and decide whether they're working for me. But I might look at this very differently if it was recommending a procedure to myself and my surgeon of what to do, and we currently can't do this. And finally, counterfactual things, which is related to the stop sign. If the neural network was trained and all its examples had the rooster crowing in the morning and had the sun rising in the morning, the neural network does not know if the rooster causes the sun to rise, the sun causes the rooster to rise, or they're both correlated. And it doesn't know if the rooster doesn't crow, will the sun rise? And so there's sort of great limits and blind spots that can happen uh, with these neural networks. Nevertheless, they're gonna cause profound changes in my judgment. Uh, and so let me represent that with this graph on the future of work and really society in general. So this is due to Moshe Vardy, a great computer scientist. Um, so on the x-axis, we have cognitive and manual. So cognitive says you're doing it in your mind and manual says you're doing it with your hands and your body. On the y-axis, we have repetitive and unique. So are you doing a task over and over again that's essentially identical, or in the other extreme, is every task you do unique? And all of these many, many jobs and other things are a mix of these. So how does information technology and AI affect these things? Well, the easiest thing for information and technology and AI to replace are the repetitive cognitive functions. These three women uh, work for NASA, and they were portrayed in the movie Hidden Figures. They were called computers because they did calculations of how spacecraft were going to fly uh, before machines could be trusted. This task has been totally subsumed by computers to the point where we find it uh, funny that a human could be referred to as a computer. As a vestige of this, one of my professional organizations, ACM, stands for the Association of Computing Machinery to distinguish it from human computers. Okay, so computers took over repetitive cognitive functions. It took a lot longer for computers to help and replace people in the drudgery of sort of repetitive manual functions like uh, this picture depicting an assembly line, but that has increasingly happened. 
with AI, computing can now start moving toward things that are less repetitive, uh, longer to get to totally unique, but less repetitive. So for example, um, teaching is a pretty cognitive function. So at what point is computing going to replace teachers? Well, I'm hoping, uh, this picture of me here, that we're not replacing teachers, but we're taking away the repetitive tasks of teachers, like grading, moving us up to do the more unique things. And finally, the last thing to be replaced are the unique manual tasks. Uh, every crawl space is different, and so it's more, more impractical to replace plumbers. And I don't see this replacing, I see this as letting humans move to better jobs. Uh, so for example, in 1850, most people worked in uh, agriculture, more than half the population. Now it's only a couple percent. Yes, we still feed people and we still have people employed. Um, similarly, if you look early in the 20th century, many people actually did manual work, you know, digging ditches by hand with shovels, and that has replaced and we still have jobs. So the economists tell me that even as we replace jobs, we move people. Uh, not, not to say, though, that doesn't cause uh, very big disruptions in people's lives, uh, what economists call creative destruction. So I do think IT and uh, AI is moving humans toward the unique and creative, but the process is going to be bumpy. So into this milieu, the CCC, uh, Community Community Consortium that I ran, partnered with the American Association of Artificial Intelligence, or AAAI, and we did a research roadmap. And we, uh, we uh, acknowledged the tremendous success of learning from patterns that uh, I talked about in the deep neural networks. But we feel that there needs to, and companies are really running with this, there needs to be uh, married with a bunch of uh, academic work funded by the government on human-like symbolic reasoning. Symbols are things like numbers. Six is a symbol, seven is a symbol, addition is a, a logical function, you get 13. Neural networks don't do this very well, humans do. And we believe by marrying the two, we can do even greater things. And so we have a whole bunch of technical recommendations uh, for a 10-year roadmap that are way beyond the scope of this talk, but you can, uh, you can Google it if you want to learn more. Okay, so that's the end of the AI machine learning. I think it's, it's had tremendous change, and it's, it, but more change is afoot, and it's going to free us from a lot of repetitive tasks. I'm going to now move to something that's really out there, uh, both in terms of time and how bizarre it is. And this is quantum computing, which you may or may not have heard of. And this is going to enhance discovery. However, the but is that it's someday. To understand quantum computing, we have to look at regular computing, which in this context is called classical computing. Computers store everything as numbers, like the numbers you know, one, two, three, four. They store them as binary numbers, which you, know, you don't have to pay too much attention to, but think of it as numbers. Uh, and the numbers, like one bit, you can think of it like a penny on a table. There's two possibilities. You can have tails up or you can have heads up, but at any given time, only one of them is up. So it's one of two possibilities. And because we're nerds, we represent things with numbers. We don't use pennies. We call it zero or one. So you might say this is pretty limiting. You can only represent two things. Well, we can represent more things by having more bits. So if we have two bits or two pennies, that can represent four possibilities, tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, or heads, heads. But if you have two pennies on a table, only one of those four possibilities is, is extent at any given time. And if you take this further, if you have eight pennies or eight bits, that represents 256 possible values. That's sufficiently important in computers that's given a special name that's called a byte. Uh, and that is used to represent characters, punctuation, uh, uh, numbers, et cetera. Uh, and if you've probably heard of a byte, uh, you might have heard that your, the memory in your computer has a, more than a gigabyte. A gigabyte just means a billion bytes. So we have a lot of these pennies in our computer. Okay, and you know, if you have more bits, if you have n bits, the number of possible values rises exponentially. But even if you have a whole bunch of pennies, you throw them on the table, they have picked one set of head and tail values, one set of zeros and ones. Classical computing. What about quantum computing? Let's do a thought experiment. 
let's say somehow that we could have a two bit number that somehow was all combinations of tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, and heads, heads. Kind of like there was like two pennies spinning on the table who have not yet committed themselves to what they're going to be. And they, there are these four values with some probability. Right? Somehow you control this. So it's 10% likely to end up tails, tails, and 35% tails, heads, 25% heads, tails, 30% heads, heads. Now, if you could kind of do this and you think of putting this in a machine, like that would be bizarre and counterintuitive. That couldn't really happen, could it? Um, well, it turns out quantum mechanics is bizarre and, and counterintuitive. And quantum mechanics deals with the very, very small and the very, very fast. And all of our common sense develops on human sizes and human time scales. And so that's where our intuition is. So the fact that this very different uh, space and time scale is different allows it to be counterintuitive. So let me tell you about uh, quantum mechanics. And if you think this doesn't make sense, uh, I don't blame you. It took me a long time. So quantum computing uses something called qubits. Qubits is just a shortened term of quantum bit. And a quantum bit until it's looked at, or technically it's called measured, not only can it be a zero one, it can be sort of all values from zero to one. How do we get our head around this? Think of it as, as it's kind of like a globe, right? That the North Pole represents a one, the South Pole represents a zero, and the quantum bit, until it's measured, you can sort of be at all latitudes and longitudes with some probability, like you're somewhere on this globe a little bit, you know, 25% of North America. Okay, that's pretty bizarre. Uh, but it gets more bizarre. If you have two or more quantum bits, they can be in all combinations of the latitudes and longitudes of both of the globes. Okay, and this allows you to represent many, many possibilities when you're looking for something. And of course, if you have more than two, it goes up astronomically. And so this is technically called entanglement. And this is where the power of quantum computing comes from. The fact that you can be in all these places limited only by your ability to control things, which is currently and will always be imperfect. Okay, so if you didn't understand that and you thought it didn't make sense, it's partially because quantum computing does not make sense. Uh, let's come back and talk about its implications. So it's a black box now. And what's the good it can do and, and what's the bad on the next slide. Okay, so it turns out it's really great for doing a hard search for something where it's easy to check if you got the right answer. Okay, and so electronic commerce or e-commerce, it turns out depends on something called factoring being hard. Uh, you all learned what factoring was in school. I'm sure you forgot what it is. So factoring is given 15, can you find the numbers that you multiply together to get 15? Well, the answer is three times five. So you think, how hard is that? Well, what about this number? This is a thousand bit number, which might be used in e-commerce, uh, which represents 300 digits. What are the numbers that you um, have to get to multiply to find this, this number? Okay, that's hard. It turns out we computer scientists and mathematicians don't know how to do this efficiently on a classical computer. But there is an algorithm called Shor's algorithm that if we could build a good enough classical uh, quantum computer, we can make this factoring easy. And the computer only has to be so good because we can easily check if we got the right factors by just multiplying things together. So this is a big motivation for quantum computing, but it's a lot further out because it requires a lot bigger quantum computers than we're gonna have for long, for decades. In the shorter term, like in a decade or so, what quantum computers are gonna be good for are hard searches for chemicals and materials. Now you might say, well, I didn't like chemistry or I didn't take chemistry, so why should I care? Well, what if quantum computers could give better molecules to do fertilizers. It comes up with better candidates and then with simulation and trials, we economically do this better fertilizer and we continue to feed people in the presence of climate change. Similarly, what if it allows us to design better drugs, these are also molecules, or, or drugs helping to deliver the drugs 
that are more specific to specific populations or even individuals. Or better materials for solar cells for converting sunlight into electrical energy to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So it's, it's these kind of searches that quantum computers can do. Not everybody's going to use a quantum computer, but many people can benefit from them. Here's a picture of a quantum computer. I believe it's a Google one. It's really big, doesn't look anything like your laptop. And here's where I'm going to come up with some of the bad news. First of all, these things are really expensive and the workable practical solutions are probably 10 to 20 years away, although it's always hard to predict when breakthroughs occur. And what's the problem? One of the things that makes this expensive is that these things have to be really cold. I don't mean northern Wisconsin winter cold. I mean really cold. Minus 459.68 degrees Fahrenheit, or within a thousandth of a degree of absolute zero. And it takes a whole bunch of machinery in a cooling hierarchy to get a little small thing cold enough to do the quantum computing. So this is not going to show up in your laptop anytime soon. The second thing is current quantum computers don't have enough qubits or quantum bits. We made a lot of progress, 12 in 2006, 53 in, in 2019, uh, but we're nowhere near the number of qubits we need to do practical things. Uh, there are some cutesy demonstrations, but, but we're not there yet. And one of the reasons is, is that in all computers, bits are realized in the physical world, and so they're imperfect. And these quantum bits are particularly imperfect. And so we need to have something called codes where we do things that correct some of the errors. Now in classical computers, such as the big memory that you have in your laptop, we can correct a lot of errors with 12.5% overhead. And since that's my field, I can tell you how we do that. In quantum computers, there are some brilliant results where you can correct errors, not with 12% overhead, but with seven times overhead. And Often that level of correction is not good enough, so you have to correct the error correction, taking seven times seven, or 49x. And I was appalled at this quantum computing workshop that I was at that the uh, quantum physicists were banding about 343 because that's seven to the third. So it's gonna be a long time for a reliable computer. Another problem is programming and debugging. Quantum computers like classical computers are gonna have this hardware, but they're also gonna have software, which will make them be able to be retargeted to do different things like fertilizers or solar cells. So how do you program these things? Well, this is a picture of some hardware, uh, could be 1940s hardware, it could be current hardware, which shows a bunch of logical gates uh, connected by wires, and you're not meant to understand what it is. Uh, I'm a computer hardware professor, so I know exactly what it is. Uh, if you program quantum computers today, uh, you have to do the equivalent of this, right? And so like, you have to be an expert on fertilizers and be able to handle something like this. In classical computing, you know, we, you know, we learned that this was too much. We gotta be able to find ways to express how to program a computer that are closer to a human thing in these programming languages like uh, Java and Python. For example, this set of gates actually represents a plus B, eight bits or one byte big. And a human can say, I want A plus B, and you get this. And that's, that allows you to specialize in you know, fertilizers and solar cells, not understanding the innards of hardware and this quantum computing. And that's where we need to get to. And CCC ran a, a great workshop to sort of start developing these abstractions and these education processes. So, for both quantum computing and AI and many other things, a particular relevant thing is the Gartner hype cycle. So this is an old thing, but this group called Gartner uh, named it and, and, and popularized it. Gartner is a group that does a lot of analysis of technology, uh, mostly for businesses, but also government and universities. And what this uh, graph shows is on the y-axis, it shows expectations, how excited people are about the technology. I know you can't see the individual technologies, but the x-axis shows time, and this is particularly important. So on the first circle here, this is the innovation trigger. People invented something cool. Somebody invented AI in 1955, uh, okay? Then we have the peak of inflated expectations. After a few years, it's shown a bunch of promise. 
Uh, people think it's 90 or 99 percent done, uh, and they're super excited how it's going to change the world in almost no time. This rarely happens. You think you're 90 or 90 percent, 99 percent done, you're actually 10 percent done or 1 percent done. It takes a long time, and as this happens, you reach the trough of disillusionment. So you can think self-driving cars are right now in this trough of disillusionment. They didn't meet their promise by coming by 2019. They're probably never going to come. I think they're going to come. And that happens with a slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. Of course, not everything you know, ultimately matters, but some things are profound. This chart is from 2018. Uh, and you can see, or you can't see, it's too small, but right at the top is AI with deep neural networks. It's at the peak of its height. And here's quantum computing uh, after the innovation trigger climbing up to the, the peak as well. So where are they now in um, 2020? Well, AI has exploded. Uh, this point I'm pointing to explainable AI, which is now super overhyped, but not there yet. And all the other pieces are there. So AI has definitely reached the point where it's matured, where we're looking at bits and pieces of it. Quantum computing is actually missing from this chart. And I, Gartner doesn't tell me why, but I believe it's because they realize that, you know, it's further out than initially thought and not so relevant to businesses yet. But keep this technology in mind so that you're savvy when people say about some new thing and they're going to age say it's going to change the world and everybody's excited. And a few years later, when everybody's disappointed, we humans seem to have this tendency to overestimate things in the short run and underestimate how profound they are in the long run. Okay, so let me conclude with uh, computing and society. Computers are amoral, and I'll define that. It's up to us or humans to be moral and hopefully not immoral. Okay, so using computers for better solar panels, more efficient supply chains, remote communications, sure, I think everybody agrees that's a good idea. But what about using computing for facial recognition? Terrorists, sure, but all citizens? I don't know. Well, actually, terrorists are sufficiently rare with a few false positives most of the terrorists recognized will be innocent citizens. Recommending a movie or surgery, as we've discussed before. Predicting human behavior. There's a real example where a system was used to predict based on a bunch of data whether it was likely that a, a parolee would return to prison uh, by violating parole or committing another crime. Turns out it showed a lot of bias against African-American men. And that was without uh, you know, that race being a factor uh, into the input because the in this case, because there was bias in the data. So these are tricky problems. And you might think this is hypothetical, but last week in the New York Times, in Spain, uh, because of the pandemic, they decided not to hold some exam, but use uh, an algorithm to assign grades with some disastrous results. So these things are tricky. Let's use fairness as an example. What is, which is fair? Okay, so the left picture shows um, everybody getting an equal boost so they can try to see over the fence at the baseball game. And, this, and the right picture shows everybody getting a differential boost so they get to the same level to see the baseball game, which is fair. Is, and does the answer change whether you're talking about education or employment or accessibility? These are very difficult questions. And in fact, we don't even have good mathematical definitions of fairness. So CCC ran a workshop, um, which included a bunch of economists to try to get some results and figure out a research roadmap. And really, it's more questions than answers. It's a little bit unsatisfying, but I'll give you a few of those. OK, and you can think of these. You already know about automatic credit scores. This is about a half century old. This is kind of like doing that, but expanding it to many other realms. Uh, so what's new in these new realms is you can err a million times rather than several times. Humans make mistakes on the parole, yes, but they don't systematically make it many, many times. Ubiquity, you know, sometimes you get unintended consequences. The credit score was designed to approve people for credit cards and loans and mortgages, and it's been used to screen employees, and I've heard anecdotal evidence of even screening mates. Accountability. If you're using deep neural networks, I mean, who's going to explain or take appeals? Uh, and really, there's more questions than answers. Like, there are, you know, how do you consider factors that a person can or cannot control? You can allegedly control how hard you work. You cannot control your race. How do you uh, 
treaties. What happens when the technology is perfectly good, but the data is fed that has unfair bias? Can you unbias the bias? And if you don't believe that uh, computers should be the ultimate answer, like that disaster in Spain, um, how do we make computers work well as a tool for human deciders? So symbiotically, we can do better than individually. These are open questions. In general, I think one of the things that's happening much more than when I was an undergraduate is computing is interacting with society. And this gives us co computing professionals additional responsibility. Uh, we need to incorporate ethics and other viewpoints in our work, which requires us to do some learning, but also recognize that we need to talk to experts in other fields because nobody can learn everything. We also need to get better at building computing mechanisms to implement the policies that society wants. So what's this mechanism policy thing? Okay, so the Federal Reserve might have a policy to have low inflation or high employment, and then it uses mechanisms like the discount rate to change the money supply to implement the policy. In computing, you know, one policy that came up recently is the European Union decided that there's gonna be a policy that you have the right to be forgotten. Part, and that would mean something like if there was an arrest record that didn't lead to a conviction or a naked picture that was old enough, uh, you should be able to ask for that to be taken away. Well, it turns out that computer companies had very little ability to do this. They didn't have the mechanisms. Um, and you know maybe they are to blame or not to blame, but it's something that we computing people need to think about going forward is including mechanisms for as society decides policies. Uh, but we should also be a resource for citizens and government to decide policy because we can say a little bit about what the technology can and cannot do. I know people are give, hassling you know, companies like Google, why did your search algorithm do this? Well, you know, it comes back to the explainable AI, you know, that they actually don't know. Finally, society must remember that computers are amoral, lacking a moral sense unconcerned with the rightness or wrongness. We humans need to aspire to be moral and not immoral. And we can do this with computing as a tool, and I think we should, and we should remember that it's we who craft this. So we're gonna to move to questions, but before I do that, I wanna just leave you with some fun quotes. Uh, All computers do is fetch and shuffle numbers, but they do it fast enough that the results appear to be magic. Steve Jobs, Apple founder. This is completely true of computer hardware. I think, therefore I am. Cognito ergo sum, Descartes. It's gonna be an interesting philosophical question as we apply this to artificial intelligence. God does not play dice with the universe. This is Albert Einstein on quantum physics. Uh, in this case, the, the great man appears to have been wrong that quantum physics does tremendously rely on probability. And finally, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So when you look at some of the things that we do, like we really do have Dick Tracy watches and Star Trek-like communicators, uh, it seems like science fiction and magic, but it's not magic. We humans create it, we humans could control it. Um, you can encourage your uh, children and grandchildren to go into this field. I think it's a fascinating field. Uh, it appears like magic, but it's not. Okay, and so those are the four topics. And now we're gonna start segueing into the question and answer. Uh, to do that, I remind you that you press chat and then you can enter your question. Uh, in the abstract, I talked about uh, that you could submit questions in advance and I got a couple of questions. And I'm gonna start with those two questions while you um, hopefully think of others. Uh, so the, the, whoops, the first question is, are there issues in protecting the national power grid against cyber attacks? So this is the electric power grid. Uh, well, I looked into this a little bit because I wasn't an exact expert, and it turns out the industry is spending tens of billions of dollars to protect the power grid from attacks, right? You don't want the uh, terrorists to be able to uh, tell generators or power stations to uh, explode. Uh, and um, I tried to look into some of the details. It turns out a lot of things were password protected. So I couldn't actually get at all the details. Uh, and that's probably a good thing. Uh, I'm not a terrorist, but the terrorists could be doing research as well. Uh, 
So I won't answer this specific question, but I, I will talk a little bit about security and incentives with cyber attacks, because one of the problems that we have in our IT milieu is a lot of the incentives are wrong for power companies, but, but even for software manufacturers. So let me use the example of Zoom, which we're all using today. So when Zoom was developing its product, among the things it could do was develop a nice user interface and good security. Zoom chose to do a nice user interface and lousy security. And then what happened is enough people used Zoom and there was enough pressure put on that they had enough money that then they could improve their security. And so now their security is, is okay, but not great. Uh, and so what's wrong with this picture? Well, you don't know how much information was leaked early and you can't say Zoom, the developers of Zoom was irrational, right? They did the right business thing to get to the place where they were used enough that people complained about their security. And so we as a society have to figure out how to create the right incentives in economics it's called mechanism design that can marry computer security uh, with other things and i'm sorry if i went a little field from the power grid but i didn't have that much specific information so the second of the two questions that i'll do is uh, what are emerging opportunities for hackers uh, well uh, there's millions of opportunities uh, it turns out one particularly interesting one, in my view, goes back to the second part of this talk in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So remember that machine learning was trained uh, with data. And so what if you ma maliciously and carefully inserted data into the pipeline that would sort of corrupt the machine learning, not just in a few examples, but would really confuse it, would make it less, much less good at recognizing real stop signs, okay? Researchers, at the University of Wisconsin and other places have shown both this is possible and are working at ways of mitigating this. So not only can attackers attack the things we've explicitly programmed, they can even attack these new uh, machine learning techniques. Okay, and so with that, I think we'll now move into the, uh, the, the online question and answering. So I think what I'm gonna do is, shall I stop screen sharing? stop sharing and we're going to get ready for questions and so trish you're going to unmute and start reading me questions is that the plan okay um the first one is how well does artificial intelligence think outside the box that is where is imagination in artificial intelligence uh artificial intelligence uh doesn't think out of the box currently it uh well Actually, I should be careful. Let's say, let's talk about machine learning and deep neural networks first. It doesn't think out of the box. It learns by patterns. In some sense, it's doing very sophisticated interpolation. Um, I think uh, there's, and there's other technologies. I think they're very limited in their ability to do imagination. And I guess as a human, I think that's a really good thing. I want this technology to take away the drudgery. I am not upset that I don't have to retype my papers on a manual typewriter anymore. That drudgery is gone and I'm left to be more creative in the words I'm creating. And so this, this technology is very limited. It seems to be doing magical things, but it, it really can only do some things. Okay, here's a, I think easy one. Um, is the US the leader in artificial intelligence? Okay, so the United States is currently the leader in, in artificial intelligence, but our lead is uh, greatly threatened. Uh, we have been very good at developing technologies that take a long time. I mentioned AI started in 1955. Uh, recently, there's been you know, much reduction in government investment in, in, um, in research because it's viewed as an expense. I view it as an investment. Uh, and other countries have gotten greatly interested, uh, particularly China. And uh, I guess I am concerned that our, our lead can be threatened by the fact that while we may have certain concerns of civil rights and balancing things, uh, those concerns and those trade-offs may be done differently in other countries. So this is no time to be complacent because I think this is a big deal and the leaders of this are going to reap rewards for a long time in my judgment. Okay. 
The next two are kind of related. They are wondering how um, AI slash driverless cars um, will be dealing with illogical or irrational situations. Okay, like, that, like, like crashes or whatever, yeah. No, 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 that's a really excellent question. So there's, a, there's evidence to suggest that a, a harder situation is driverless, driverless cars with human drivers interacting together. That's a harder situation than when you have a situation where almost all the driving is done by technology and it's done in predict predictable ways and communicated. That is a great challenge. And uh, what's particularly hard with self-driving cars is uh, that, you know, if a situation only happens, you know, in one in a million days, you know, if there's a million drivers, it happens every day. And so like really rare situations happen and we need the ability uh, to generalize. I wanna make one more comment about driverless cars. That's a really interesting term if you look at it historically. A hundred years ago, there was something called a horseless carriage, where an automobile was defined by what it didn't have. It didn't have a horse. And so driverless cars is, is another vestige of that. We're defining this new technology by what it doesn't have. It doesn't have a driver. We're going to probably change the self-driving cars. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts about sophisticated robots interacting with humans or other living creatures and how we grow increasingly accustomed to them as replacements for other humans? Okay, giving me all the easy questions. <laughs> uh, th this is a really big challenge, okay? So, um, you know, so it's one thing to have a robot on an assembly line, right, where you're, you're told do not get anywhere close, right? It's another thing if we're gonna eventually have robots and Japan is the leader of this and they have the most quickly aging population that are gonna help you take a bath because then the robot has to be strong enough to lift you and, but hopefully not make mistakes and damage you. And this is an exceedingly uh, big challenge. And I don't, people are working at answers and it's, you know, we have to make things fail safe, but your the the questioner was um, exactly right. There was a second part to the question. Uh, let's see. What are your thoughts about sophisticated robots interacting with humans and how we grow increasingly accustomed to them as replacements for other humans? Um, how we grow increasingly, you know, robots are not going to replace humans. I mean, we need human contact. Uh, we're used to machines replacing other things. You know, people used to love their horses uh, and, and we've replaced that. Uh, robots can serve a function. Uh, to me, it's a sad world if the robot is uh, your only friend. Okay. This next one, I'm not sure if this is your bailiwick, it may be more sociology related, but um, they were asking about the internet age with so much information and disinformation on the internet. Um, how can we more objectively get back to facts um, to have objective discussions and how do we teach kids to interpret what they read on the internet? Right, I'll comment on that question, you know, as a computer scientist and as someone who has, you know, read about other things. It's a, it's a big problem, right? There's a definition, uh, you know, the difference between training and education is that education should teach you to question the quality of information that you're getting. And one of the, the internet has done, you know, propaganda and, and incorrect things is not new, uh, but the internet has made this a lot worse. Uh, uh, two ways, one is that it, it allows, uh, all information can look the same, right? The Mayo Clinic and somebody else's website can look just as legit. Uh, and secondly, people can spread information in, in, in echo chambers. Uh, so I think we need, you know, we do need to teach people to question all the information that they're getting. Uh, we can develop some assist. I noticed that uh, Facebook was getting great grief uh, because they tagged, uh, Tucker Carlson's comments, I forget what the comments were on, as false. Um, and uh, they were accused of censorship, uh, which is uh, not a true statement because they didn't remove the post, they just tagged it. 
I think we're going to, we can get, develop some tools to help people. Uh, one of the really interesting analysis I saw of misinformation and disinformation from the 2016 election was somebody did an analysis where the, a report appeared somewhere and then a similar report appeared somewhere else and they drew an arrow from the first report to the second report and they watched how reports moved around the world. And in the 2016 election, quite a bit of the information out there, political, was sourced out of Russia, uh, both from the right and the left. And this was analysis done without even saying, you know, is the content correct or not? It was just watching the, um, the pedigree uh, of, of the information. So I think we can develop tools to help, but we, we just have to get, I mean, pe people need to think more. And it's very hard because it used to be, you know, if, so if somebody was legit enough that it got in a book, you know, it had to have some truth in it. And uh, I'm totally against, you know, eliminating free speech and I, I don't have good solutions. But, you know, if you ask me, has the internet made this problem worse? I'm afraid the answer is yes. And that answers the, the last question we have is, does computing make misinformation, disinformation or propaganda worse? <laughs> I think it, I think it absolutely does. And, uh, you know, but we have to remember that we humans need to be in charge. And so maybe we can do, maybe there's some technology fixes, but you know, that people that go out and say that companies like Facebook and Twitter, you know, they need to handle this. Uh, first of all, I'm not convinced they have the mechanisms to handle this, but secondly, I don't think, or actually really firstly, I don't think it's appropriate, right? We are a country and we should decide as a country how we're going to handle this and you know companies are one agent in our company in our country they shouldn't be the ones deciding does anybody else have any questions that you want to now's your big chance so far no We'll give it another minute. Someone, thank you for a great presentation. Oh, thank you. And I believe this is recorded and within a week will be put up on the Plato website. So if you want to recommend it to others, I'm an academic, so I appreciate all the publicity I can get. Whoops, I heard a beep. Nope, that was it. Okay, well, if no one has any further questions, thank you to Dr. Hill. You're most welcome. Okay, Bob, stop recording.